This is a CBC Podcast. Dance, Anin, Boujou, hello and welcome. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. Imagine having to uproot your life, leave your small community and family to start all over in a strange city at only 14 years old. That's the reality for many First Nation kids in northern Ontario who must leave home to finish their education. They move hundreds of kilometres away to Thunder Bay, a picturesque city on the shores of Lake Superior, where they live for at least four years. Many First Nations don't have schools for students past grade 8, making the move to the city necessary if they want a high school diploma. It's a difficult transition for many kids, but there are people in the city trying to help. I couldn't imagine some of these kids at 14 years old leaving for 10 months to come to school. We offer holistic programming, so we're not only considering academics, but we're considering uh, the very well-being of our students. There's no such thing as a bad kid. There's kids that have been put in situations where they're forced to make bad decisions, and that ultimately leads to bad outcomes. I feel good helping someone that kind of needs help with whatever they may need. If it puts a smile on their face, it makes me happy. So Today on Unreserved, how schools and grassroots initiatives are helping First Nation kids transition to life in the city. One high school in Thunder Bay offers a unique education for First Nation teens. At Matawa High School, in addition to the standard high school classes like math, science and English, students can take a variety of cultural classes as well. They can learn Ojibwe or Cree, how to play the big drum and even how to skin a deer. The CBC's Stephanie Cram visited the school to meet students and staff. Like Vice Principal Jackie Corbett, who's originally from Martin Falls First Nation. Here she is explaining how Matawa came to be. Right now we're in the principal's office at the Matawa Education and Care Centre, our school facility. Oh, I think we're an amazing place, an amazing opportunity for our Indigenous students who travel from their remote communities to come to the urban centre to get a secondary education uh, that is equivalent and on board with what would be available to them in another school board. I really believe here at the Matawa Education and Care Centre, we offer holistic programming. So we're not only considering academics, but we're considering uh, the very well-being of our students, including a cultural component is huge in our program. So we have language speakers in our program who are quite fluent and can speak uh, either Ojibwe and Cree. So it's fantastic to have reflections of Indigenous culture and authentic Indigenous culture within our walls for our students to see. Matawa has been around since 2010 and originally came out of a mandate put forward by the chiefs of the Matawa First Nations. So Matawa is comprised of nine First Nations, Arrow Land, Constance Lake, Yabatung, Martin Falls, Long Lake 58 and Ganugamine, Nishkandaga, Nabinamik and Webukwe. And our chiefs put in a recommendation that we have an urban school for our learners so they can come down from the north and get an equivalent education for them. So with that, a resolution was put in, and here we are. Success for us, yes, there's the academic component of success, definitely, but there's also a social component of success for our students. Uh, wonderful when we see our, our kids graduating. There's, there's nothing better than that. But if we can lend supports in other areas, too, beyond the academic realm, then that's great. So for us, success means a student who may be struggling with addictions goes through treatment. So if a, a student is successful in working in trying to improve other areas of their lives and we can offer that support, And that's just fantastic that we have that ability now. But definitely our ultimate goal is to get these kids healthy and have pride in in themselves and in their Indigenous culture, but also, of course, to get them that OSFSD, that Ontario Secondary School Diploma. One student who has been on a path of recovery is Brianna Munias. Yeah, I don't really know much about myself. I'm just like slowly trying to discover myself again. I first moved here when I was nine, and then I got taken into care when I was 11 or 12. And then I got 
sent to Ottawa, and then I finally came back when I turned 18. So I've been here ever since then, but I've been back to the reserve back and forth. When I first moved to Thunder Bay, it was scary. But then I got used to it because I was living in a bigger city before that, so the school is good. It's amazing. Well, Joey's program, the outdoor education, that's my favorite class. I don't know, I just like going in the bush, you know, and doing all this stuff. I'm going to go pluck a goose after this. Well, I didn't really know much about my culture until I came here because it was stripped away from me when I went into care. And now, like, slowly trying to put myself out there and get involved in all these stuff. It's just been, like, it's been helping me heal and, like, you know, helping me move on with my life. And I've dealt with a lot of loss and, like, kind of lost myself, too, along the way. And how is a place like this school helping you get over that trauma? Um... I have people I can talk to, and they keep, like, trying to push me on the right track. Would you say that it feels like a family here? Yeah, because they just, like, accepted me, and they never gave up on me as much as they, like, you know, all those times I've been suspended. They could have easily given up on me, but no. And so what's your goals after high school? I want to go into something that helps people with addictions because I just... I'm slowly, yeah, slowly recovering myself from that. As Brianna mentioned, her favorite class is the outdoor education class, which Vice Principal Jackie Corbett says is one of the many components in the school helping students learn a bit more about their First Nation culture. So on staff, we have cultural workers and we have two elders. And we're so fortunate to be able to have these wonderful people in our space because they're able to address the cultural component of our program and taking our kids out on the land, making Bannock. It may sound silly, but even just having those comforts of home really help uh, engage our kids. One thing the class teaches the students is how to pluck geese. Teacher Joey Miller describes the process. How do you not rip it? So we have four students uh, sitting across from one another with uh, a goose in between each pair, and they're uh, plucking the feathers. Some of them are are pretty fast and efficient at uh, cleaning these geese. They've clearly spent lots of time in the springtime hunting geese with their families. What's going to happen to these geese once they're all plucked? So typically what we would do with them is uh, singe them over an open fire and uh, burn all the little hairs off, and then we would uh, prepare them and a few different ways. With these geese, we're going to make some goose sausage, not necessarily traditional way of preparing geese, but we think it'll be really neat to show a few different ways of making sausage. Uh, Relatively regularly, we cook traditional food with the students and try and cook as much traditional food as possible. So we've developed a course where our students can do lots of cooking and learning about food and receive credit for learning how to cook, essentially, with our elders as well as local community partners. And it's a really neat program that we have here. For Joey, learning on the land is one of the best educational opportunities for teens. And at Matawa, the students are given many opportunities to do just that. This fall, we participated in a moose hunting trip. Last spring, we did our own goose and duck hunt. And we're hoping to do a little bit more hunting this fall with partridge. And most of our students don't come from areas where there's deer. We're going to be doing a little bit of deer hunting and hopefully having students practice the whole process of skinning, to uh, butchering a deer in the next few weeks. I think one of the neatest things about our program is that we try and keep our students as connected to their communities as possible as well. So we have a canoe trip in the summer and we're planning some winter programming where we actually spend time up north and travel between the communities. And that's uh, definitely, for me, the highlight of our program here. While students are outside learning how to pluck geese, a faint drumbeat can be heard coming from inside the school where a group of boys are learning how to keep a beat. It's like when they teach you guys in hockey, like, they, they really teach you guys not to, like, um, go faster than everybody, but to work as one. It's the same thing with drumming, boys, all the coordination. And it's always important to remember to have that positive attitude, too. Because with the drumming alone, it's, it, it's itself is a learning experience as well. I've been doing it since I was about 8 years old now, boys, and I'm 26, and... The drum is still teaching me a lot of stuff. My name is Steve Batch Paneskum. I come from the community up north. uh, It's a flying reserve called Martin Falls First Nation. 
originally also known as Agoki Post. And now I, I currently reside here in Thunder Bay and work at the Matawa Education and Care Center as one of the cultural workers. My, my role specifically here is like a role model and like as a guidance for the students because I myself was once a student of the program here. And the drum that you, you heard us singing on was actually one of my, my projects as a student. And I actually wrote a big, a big paper of it about the importance of the drum and how the drum itself is a teacher. I expressed the importance of culture to our students, of how that is a major part of identity, especially for First Nations people in Canada. And ever since this drum's been happening for about, going on the third year now, this drum. This is the first drum of Mentawa ever. So for me, that's like history in the making right there. And now they can sing on their own drum at a school now. Personally, when I was their age about over 10 years ago, I didn't see myself where I am today now as a role model and as a guider to them. You know, like they come to me when they want to know certain stuff. And I get questions all the time about different subjects revolving around culture. For me personally, to see them memorizing the stuff I tell them, and it makes me feel proud that they're taking it seriously. Like they're trying to find out their identity. Even though they're from Flying Reserves, like myself, I came out here in 07, not knowing my full identity, wondering who I was. So when we have these kind of programs and these talks with them, especially our sharing circles, it brings a lot of them back down to earth. So with culture and the teachings, it helps us get past that from our own our own shell, I said, to where we want to learn more and more for self-betterment and self-improvement. And as you can see, some of them practicing their dancing moves already because we're going to be getting started with regalia making soon. It's good that they're asking questions. That's what exactly what we want is questions. Ah. Over, over three years ago before I started, when I finished my last couple credits, I was already a young man by then. But that time before I graduated, why they call me a success story is because before my graduation, two weeks exactly, I lost one of the most important people in my life, meaning my grandmother, who I basically lived out here with, with like helping her in the hospital in and out. This was all weeks before my graduation, my final exams, everything. And, you know, I had, I had a choice that very moment when it happened. Could have called it quits. But I've never been standing here right now doing this interview. Everyone in the school here and these students, you know, they, they motivate me to keep going all the time. And honestly, how it makes me feel is that I see myself as someone that says, hey, if I can do it with all this stuff happening, you can do it too. Because we all want to ach- achieve that feeling of greatness for ourselves to make our family proud. I tell them, be proud of that. Feel very fortunate. I tell them, proud to call this your own school, Matawa meaning four rivers. That's what it means, all of us coming together here in the city, basically. And before this school was even here, every Matawa student that came here wasn't together as they are right now. We were all separated everywhere, all over the city. Now, they come here, basically feels like home to them. They can relax. So you guys want to try that one? Yeah. Remember, this is just nice and light first. Despite intentions to keep the teens safe in the school, the reality for many of the students at Matawa is that living in the big city is scary. Vice Principal Jackie Corbett explains what she hears from students. We get sort of a a positive picture, but also a negative picture from our students. For some, it's their first time coming to Thunder Bay. So some of the words I've heard them say is it's, it's scary because they're unfamiliar with the lay of the land. They're not sure how the bus works. Uh, It's scary even just ordering a cheeseburger from a local fast food restaurant. Even just going to the movie theater, uh, it's scary to, to walk into a place like that. Our kids will go to the mall, and sometimes, I'm not saying all the time, but sometimes they're met by security and question as to, what are you doing here? You need to be there for a purpose. I know when I go to the mall, Nobody asks me that, so it can be very difficult. But there are some positive things, too, that are happening. I believe it was last fall we did a walking tour, 
and some of our students got to visit some of the local establishments in the Port Arthur area of, of the city. It was really welcoming. They went into these eateries, these little restaurants, and got to sample the food and just talk about this is a safe place for you. So if you're out in the city, you're not feeling safe, come in and we'll help you. So that, you know, that's awesome. (laughs) That's great messaging for them to hear that they're welcome here. My name's Jasmine Mickinac, and I'm from Webakwe First Nation. What's it like to be a youth living in the city? It's kind of scary at times. My mom worries a lot about me when I go out. So does my grandma. They don't really like me being out late or anything. And I've been here all my life, so I don't really feel as scared as maybe other kids would. But it's still pretty scary at times. It's gotten a little crazy lately, but it's still home. Tell me what you like about uh, about the school. And there's always activities to do. Like every Tuesday we go to the movies. Every Friday we go bowling, and there's always, like, all these other fun stuff to do. It's my favorite. So tell me the thing that you're most proud of accomplishing since coming to the school. Actually staying this long, because usually I give up, but this year I'm pretty determined to finish, so. What are some of your goals after you leave the school? What are, what are some of your personal goals? My personal goal is to be a counselor, like for kids, because uh, I had a counselor when I was younger, and she helped me through a lot. So I want to be able to do that for other kids. From cultural programming to the many after-school activities offered to students, Matawa has figured out exactly what's needed to keep kids motivated to stick to their education. Alex Coaster moved to the city to go to school, and he's now setting roots here. Been living in Thunder Bay for like three years, I guess, since I came out to Thunder Bay. I moved here, moved out here for school, high school. First, I went to uh, Hammersholt, then I moved over to Matawa, because that's where all my cousins were. I like that uh, that there's a lot of stuff going on, like almost every day. And, um, my favorite is probably the hockey and bowling. The hockey's nowadays are in the morning. They used to be in the afternoon, so. I have to get up in the morning. <laughs> I have to get up at... From Ryan Johnson, the director of Star Wars, comes Knives Out, a fun, fresh, modern take on the classic whodunit mystery genre where everyone is a suspect. After a family gathering has gone awry, true colors are shown, and Knives Come Out, starring Daniel Craig, Chris Evans, and Anna de Armas, Knives Out is certified fresh on Rotten Tomatoes. Opening in theaters everywhere, November 27th. Uh, Just before 9 o'clock, so I can jump the bus and make it here. I want to finish school, and I also want to spend time with my mom, my my other siblings over there back home. Do you miss your family back home? Uh, Yeah, but I got my own family here in Thunder Bay, too. Got a little girl. She's one years old. Tell me the one thing that you're most proud of that you've accomplished since coming to this school. I guess just getting progress, like getting work done. Just proud to be here. Hopefully I can graduate uh, maybe by 2021. I'm hoping to go to the, the college or the university. Hopefully I can get some opportunities after graduating. For CBC Unreserved, I'm Stephanie Crown. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. This week, we're taking a look at what it's like for First Nation teens living and going to school in Thunder Bay, often far from their home communities. Eight years ago, Toronto Star reporter Tanya Talaga was sent on assignment to Thunder Bay. She was supposed to write about why First Nation people weren't voting in the federal election, But when she got there, she was told about another more important story, the unsolved deaths of seven First Nations students who were living in Thunder Bay to attend high school. Tanya soon realized there wasn't enough room in a standard 800-word article to tell the story of these tragic deaths, so she wrote a book. Seven Fallen Feathers is about those seven teens who traveled far from their homes to attend school. It's a story about the legacy of residential schools. It's a story about Canada. A warning before we begin, though, that aspects of what we will be discussing is sensitive and can be difficult for some in the audience to listen to. Tanya Talaga joins me from Toronto. 
Welcome back to the show. It's good to see you or to hear you, I should say. Thanks, <laughs> thanks, thanks for having me. Just picture me in your mind. <laughs> I am. You've spent years now reporting on Thunder Bay. What do you want people to know about what life is still like there for First Nation youth? Some things have improved in Thunder Bay. There is right off the front, I could say that there's so much increased awareness about what's happening uh, to our youth in Thunder Bay, things that they're facing, uh, what everyday life is like for them. But there needs to be so much more change happening. The change that we need in Thunder Bay, we need in many of our, our nations and for many of our people, we need equity. And all of these things affect how our children are and the experiences they're having every day in the city of Thunder Bay. Things like, you know, not having safe housing or not having access to uh, high school education in their own community. And that's Mm. why they're in Thunder Bay in the first place. You know, we still have a long way to go with things like that. DFC, Dennis Franklin Cromarty High School, where six of the seven Fallen Feathers went to school. They need a new school and they need a residence for the children so the kids don't have to take public transit, which they're all still doing Mm. every day to get to and from their boarding homes where they live with people who are paid to take care of them. There's still so much happening yeah. in Thunder Bay. You know, I wish I could tell you that the racist attacks against the kids have stopped too, but they haven't. Hmm. Now, you were first sent on assignment uh, to Thunder Bay in 2011. What changes have you seen that are positive for First Nation youth that have lived in the city? One huge change actually off the top is uh, the school where Jordan uh, went, Matawa. He was a he was a boy. Um, he was in grade nine. He disappeared on February seventh, twenty eleven, mm-hmm. and he was the one that sort of brought me to the whole story of the seven fallen feathers. And uh, the school he went to, Matawa, it was housed in an office tower. Um, it o- occupied a couple floors in this nondescript, horrible nineteen seventies office tower that had no playground, no library, no cafeteria. You looked outside onto this decrepit little parking lot. Mm -hmm. It was awful. I'm so happy to say that Matawa has a brand new facility. It's gorgeous. The space is incredible. And Matawa has really worked hard to build this wonderful school community. There's an incredible gym. There's a hockey program. And Mm -hmm. Jordan was a goalie. He loved hockey. And there's so much uh, hockey equipment, too, that has been brought and donated uh, brand new to the school. There is a, a safe space for the kids in the school for them to come if if they've had too much to drink or they need they need a safe spot for them to go to. And they also have a residence that's about ready to open that's going to have um, room for a hundred kids to live. Mm-hmm. Brand new and beautiful. Matawa is shining and wonderful and beautiful. And I have to tell you that when I went in to see it for the first time, it broke my heart. Mm. It was bittersweet. You know, yeah. it was just, it just really got me. I was so happy for all the kids. But, you know, I just, I cried for Jordan. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Things are shifting, though. Slowly. Things are, you know, things are shifting. But, you know, the investigation into the deaths of nine First Nations people is, that's just beginning now mm-hmm. from a multidisciplinary task force um, of officers and the chief coroner of Ontario, um, it's also part of that. That's just started, and that came out of the OIPRD report, um, which was headed up by Dr. Jerry McNeely. And they sent investigators up to investigate the Thunder Bay police to see if systemic racism was in actual fact the problem that everyone who's First Nations, who lives in Thunder Bay, has been saying it is for decades. Mm-hmm. You know, and guess what? The um, report found that, yes, there is systemic racism in the Thunder Bay Police. And so they uh, said that nine death cases should be reinvestigated, uh, First Nations death cases, since 2000. Mm -hmm. And of those nine, four of them are the seven fallen feathers. That is just beginning. You know, we still see, though, violence on the streets. We've we've still had children dying in the water, children go missing. Yeah. There there are problems. But a guiding light, Matawa, uh, another change is the Thunder Bay Public Library system. I got to tell you, it's been amazing. The um, Thunder Bay Public Library has really stepped up and become this community hub in places where no one else in the community has really stepped up. They have uh, at the Brody Street Library certain days where um, you can go and visit a public health nurse if you need to. You can go visit someone um, that can help you fill out paperwork and fill out applications for housing. It's really become a special, special space. I can't say enough 
enough good things about the library. They've even promoted Robin Madison. She's an Indigenous librarian. And they've just sort of taken it and run with it. They hold special reading series. They hold a book club. They invite community. They're looking at language. They're doing so much to help when um, not a lot of other people have been. So Mm. it's been fantastic. So all of this has happened. Your book is published. Thunder Bay holds an inquiry. Uh, In June, as you mentioned, the police announced that they're reopening the investigation of nine. Four Mm. of them were in your book. What does this all mean for the families and communities of these teens? You know, it's it's tough. I remember when the OIPRD report came out and said that we need to reinvestigate the, the nine deaths. Um, and I remember calling uh, Dora Morris. Uh, Dora is Jethro's aunt, and she was the one that took care of uh, Jethro in Thunder Bay and went looking for him on the streets, and um, she cared for him like her own son. Mm-hmm. And I remember when I called her to ask her what she thought, she said to me, 19 years is a long time. Mm-hmm. It was November 11th, actually, um, 2000, that uh, his body was found in in the river. It is a long time, you know, and I I really hope for the best. And I know the families hope for the best, too. Um, You know, time can sometimes be difficult. It can erase memories. Evidence gets lost. How do you go back? How do you go back and do those things? You know, I really hope that the people they have working on these cases are experts in cold cases. I hope they know how to work from a lot of the times with not a lot. I really hope that justice can be can be done here because the families deserve no less. I mean, these these children deserve no less. Um, they deserve to be honored and remembered, and they deserve the justice that they did not get. Mm-hmm. We don't want to lose any more of these kids. That's right. That's right. Often people will think, well, this is just an isolated thing that happens in Thunder Bay, but um, that's that's really not the case. What does this story say about Canada? It it isn't the case, you know. The um, you can see the patterns. You can see even things like you know the families, how the families were treated, the families of the seven fallen feathers and of of others that have died in Thunder Bay, you know, not being called by health authorities, not being called by police, or um, kept in the loop about what's going on with their cases. You see that time and time again with murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls throughout the country with their families as well. And you see these horrible things still happening, this this gulf of misunderstanding and, and racism and, you know, what's going on. I mean, just recently, you know, um, we actually had a memorial on November 11th of this year remembering two of, of the children, um, Paul Panachies and Jethro Anderson, two of the Seven Fallen Feathers. And we were also remembering very much a, a 19-year-old youth who um, was in crisis and showed up to the Thunder Bay Regional Health Sciences Center Emergency Department, taken there by paramedics. And somehow he was escorted off the hospital property across the street by security guards, and he was left on Lakehead University's property. And it was um, security of Lakehead that apparently found him hanging from a tree. Mm. You know, it's like, it's that, that unfortunately is Thunder Bay. That unfortunately is reality and what we are still facing, not just in Thunder Bay, but all across the country. There is no excuse for not getting health care when you show up at a hospital. You know, the circumstances are now being investigated once again by the chief coroner of Ontario. And I really hope that everything comes to light because I know the family have answers. And I know the father that's involved with this with this case. And it's just... It's stunning, you know. It's just like we seem to always make two steps forward and then it's 10 steps backwards sometimes. Mm -hmm. Mm. Well, Tani, thank you so much for your time today. Miigwech for continuing to share our voices. Mm -hmm. Tanya Talaga is a reporter for the Toronto Star. She's working on a documentary for CBC about Thunder Bay called Spirit to Soar, which will be out next year. A new class offered at Dennis Franklin Cromartie High School is taking students out of the classroom and onto the ice. In the brand new hockey class, students train in the sport and even get school credit. He's only a few months in, but student Wolf Tate says his skills in the sport have improved. It's really fun, especially with all my friends here. I feel like we share a great bond every time we're on ice. I think I've improved in some of my uh, edge work and my passings. You know, just a lot of fun, especially being 
coached by our uh, teacher here, you know. He's a really good hockey player. More from the Dennis Franklin Cromartie Hockey School coming up. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. This week, we're taking a look at what it's like for First Nation youth living in Thunder Bay. For many of them, coming to the city for school can be scary. Walking around town, students say they are judged and they feel like they don't fit in. Wake the Giant is a campaign launched by teachers from Dennis Franklin Cromartie High School, which helps identify businesses across the city that are welcoming and offer a much-needed safe space for students and the larger Indigenous population in the city. My name is Sean Spenrath, and I am one of the organizers of Wake the Giant. So the idea behind Wake the Giant is to set up inclusive spaces around the city of Thunder Bay for Indigenous people, but particularly for Indigenous youth that are coming to Thunder Bay for school and to receive an education because a lot of the communities up north don't have past grade 10. So what we've done is we've set up these inclusive spaces around the city. We're up to 300 now which is well past our goal. We had an original goal of 150, and getting to 300 was like, booyah, super excited. Now we're trying to parlay that into setting up a relationship with all these businesses, whether that's like getting the kids jobs, bringing them into the school, uh, taking field trips to get the kids out to those businesses, just really trying to root them into the community in a positive way that gives them a positive experience in Thunder Bay and gives them just support and role models that they can look up to while they're here in town. We've always had this idea of there's no such thing as a bad kid. There's kids that have been put in situations where they're surrounded by bad people and they're forced to make bad decisions and that ultimately leads to bad outcomes. But what if we took that same kid and we surrounded them with a person that's loving, that's supportive, that wants to help them and see them succeed? Well, you're, you're going to find that those kids are going to have good outcomes instead of the bad outcomes. So really, they're they're leaving their friends, their family, everyone they know behind to get an education. So we should be doing everything we can as a city to help them succeed. Because if we're not, we're doing a huge disservice to them. But we're also doing a disservice to our community as well. The Indigenous population is one of the fastest growing populations in Thunder Bay. I think it's our largest population right now. So local businesses, they have that incentive to step up and join this program because that's our largest tourism market as well. So the sticker campaign just says, Wake the Giant, and it has a picture of the sleeping giant. So what we did with the sticker program, again, is just to to give businesses a stake in it kind of take those positive voices in the community that want to make a difference and want to help those kids succeed and elevate those voices. The kids have had a lot of negative experiences with racism, people rolling their eyes at them when they take out their status card or people following them in stores. And we kind of wanted to just try and eliminate that. In that way, I feel like we're making a difference. So there's 300 businesses. Uh, A lot of them are like restaurants, local shops. Uh, We've tried to stay locally, but we've got like TD Bank, uh, BMO. You got like local businesses like Barbecue There's a lovely body soap dispensary. We have, they're they're wide ranging, like they're all over the map. The major thing is we want to make sure our kids are safe when they're coming here. And so the big push was how can we create spaces where if the kids ever feel like they're in trouble, they can go there. And that's the major thrust of Wake the Giant is if a kid is ever in trouble, they can run to that business and the business will help them. The first thing we heard from the kids when they see the logo, uh, they're actually getting to experience the logo. So we've taken it a step further and we've started to really build that relationship with the business that has put up the logo. So I think we've already done about 30 of them now where we'll have classes go out to these businesses or the businesses come into the school and do a workshop with the kids or just hang out with the kids, show them around, show them their business. Uh, So we've hit like BMO Bank, we've hit City of Thunder Bay, we've hit the hospital. So they're getting all these really unique experiences from those businesses. And the businesses on that side are also getting to know a little bit about our kids. They're actually, they're not just reading it on the paper we provided them about the cultural experience. They're getting to interact with our kids and see what they're like and interact with them and enjoy their company. My name's Erin DeLorenzi and I own the Sweet North Bakery with my husband and I manage and bake mostly. I'm the husband. My name is Chris DeLorenzi. Um, I make most of the meats in-house and condiments and work with my wife. Yeah, we're in our bakery at 10 Court Street South uh, in the Rattan Block in downtown Thunder Bay. 
I think it was just an obvious no brainer that, yeah, this positive group of people wants to do something good for our city. Why wouldn't we be involved? So last spring, Sean and a group uh, brought a bunch of DFC students to the bakery to hear about our business. And uh, we just kind of talked about, this is our business, you're welcome here, bring your resumes, hang out with your friends, like, we want to see you here. And I thought that was amazing, because they just walked around the neighborhood with people they trusted, and they were able to go into stores that maybe they were too shy to go into before. Then they heard the owners, and not, we weren't the only business, but then they hear the owners of the business saying, you are welcome here by me and our staff will treat you right i mean that's the best connecting with those kids is what it's all about i work the front of house frequently and i've seen a significant increase in indigenous patrons which just warms my heart because i used to see them walk by and try i've talked to so many people how do i get them in here like i want them to feel welcome i want everyone to feel welcome no matter where you're coming from, but we wanted to see our Indigenous population feel like this is their space too. And so putting that sticker on there and partnering with the group from Wake the Giant, definitely I've seen more Indigenous customers. It's awesome. For myself, I actually traveled for 15 years to First Nations communities throughout North America. So I've been everywhere into the Arctic Circle, up with uh, the Pueblo, I've been to Pekanjikum, I've been to Eva Matung, Mishka Gogame. And so I've seen a lot where the youth are coming from and some of the challenges that they're, they're growing up in. And so I have a, a real heart to see that piece of education and empathy um, kind of come forward into the forefront so that we can start moving towards more of a, a partnership. My experience being in those communities has richly blessed my life and there's so much that I've learned just being with the First Peoples of Canada and I think uh, we're in a season and a time really to see the destiny of what our country looks like when you have true partnership. Thunder Bay I believe is positioned to be an example to the country and this is the beginning of it and this is just the start of the potential and I think the whole country needs to keep their eyes on Thunder Bay. There's a few things we've heard and I think it it works better with examples. The first one we got this lovely message probably like three weeks into starting the program from a young lady who messaged us on Facebook and she talked about how she found it really difficult to go into counseling and how she had lost her sister and she'd been putting it off going into counseling. And one day she finally gained the nerve to go to the counseling place. She was super nervous to talk to someone. And when she got to the counseling place, she saw the Wake the Giant sticker on the on the door and she told us she instantly felt like relieved that there was at least someone that was trying to be more welcoming to Indigenous people. And this sense of relief kind of flooded over her when she got to the door and she felt really comfortable knowing that the staff were at least trying to be more welcoming uh, to Indigenous people. That was Sean Spenrath, a teacher at Dennis Franklin Cromartie High School in Thunder Bay. He helped launch the Wake the Giant sticker campaign created to help First Nations people identify businesses that are welcoming and safe. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. This week, we're discovering what it's like for Indigenous youth who have to move from their home communities to Thunder Bay to finish high school. One school that's trying to make things better for those students is Dennis Franklin Cromartie. There are tailored classes to give students a head start and potential career in trades like woodworking and welding. The school also offers great sports programs with a brand new class this year that focuses on a favorite pastime in the North, hockey. The CBC's Stephanie Cram went to the arena to check it out. My name is Mike Compon and I am the rec and athletic director at DFC and I teach the PAL 2-0 which specializes for us for hockey. 
Well, you know what? We just teach the fundamentals of hockey, you know, the stick handling, checking, skating, and then we try and advance it for them. But a lot of these students, you know, they come from communities where hockey's always been a part of their life, and um, it's a class we wanted to offer because the kids have a lot of interest, and uh, so far it's been very successful. The City of Thunder Bay, Right to Play, uh, Jumpstart, they all jumped on board and have kind of helped us uh, get this started. Jumpstart through Canadian Tire, they donated 20 sets of equipment and Right to Play offers funding for materials and that. And then and NEC, our school board, they've been wonderful. And if we need some and we approach them, they, they tend to help us out. So they, they've been fantastic too. I think sports bring people together. You know, you got to work as a team. A lot of the learning skills such as communication, teamwork, and even developing skills that by being dedicated to some is some that they could take to the next stages when they go to college or whatever they choose to do. We're on the ice three times a week, so Monday, Wednesday, Thursday for about an hour and 20 minutes. And then the other days of the week, we focus on, say, nutrition or off-ice training, the weight room, or we play other sports that we've learned that multi-sport athletes become better hockey players. A lot of those skills we learn in other sports can be transferable to on ice. I mean, just the opportunity to be on the ice three times a week has really, I believe, has gotten the kids more engaged in their learning in other classes. But it's fun to see them out there enjoying competing and trying to get better. Uh, My name is Wolf Tate, and I'm from uh, Satchel Lake, Ontario. Well, it's been kind of hard, like, being away from family and all, but... I live with a boring parent. His name's Doug, and you know he really supports me in everything I do. I was just excited about coming here to play some hockey and you know just start some new things, like new hobbies and all that. Yeah. How long have you been playing hockey? Probably since I was like six years old when my uh, dad first put me on some skates. Yeah. And and what do you like about the sport? Just the fast pace, you know. You know, just sometimes gets fun, especially when you score a goal. Like it's a surreal feeling. Hockey school, I think it's uh, really fun, and you know, helps kids come to school more often. You get to learn more about the sport. It's awesome. Usually during school, I'm usually rushing through my work just to make it the ice time faster. I guess just kill some time doing my work. So it's really fun especially with all my friends here i feel like we share a great bond every time we're on ice i think i've been proven in some of my uh edge work and my passings you know just a lot of fun especially being co- coached by our uh, teacher here you know he's a really good hockey player well I, I view it as being trained by a pro so i mean i feel really great about it you know i ask him about advice every time before every game Oh, well, he taught me just, uh, first off, just keep it simple, you know, for the first few games anyways, until I get really comfortable with my teammates. I grew up playing, you know, I uh, played locally for the Thunder Bay Flyers here, and then I spent four years at the collegiate level in the States, so I was lucky enough to get a full scholarship there, and then after that I played 11 years pro, that took me you know, through North America, but I spent uh, seven years in Munich, Germany, and then one year in Japan, and then one year in Belfast. Believe it or not, I've been away from my home since I was 16 years old. So you yourself were away from home at the age of 16. Can you relate to what the kids coming from the north have to go through? To a certain degree, but a lot of these kids that are coming from up north, it's it's a big transition for them, you know, but for me, I moved to another home, but I was still, the city size was the same. A lot of the stuff were the same. So, I mean, it's comparable, but not comparable, you know. So I couldn't imagine some of these kids at 14 years old leaving for 10 months to come to school, you know. I I couldn't imagine because at 16, it was tough for me. And um, to be away from my family, I couldn't imagine how tough it would be. Uh, my name is Dylan Nikis, and I'm from Deer Lake. I had to move away from home to come high school. Yeah. And how did that make you feel, having to move away? Excited, but also nervous, because I've never been away from home this long. I don't know if I would fit in and bring away from home. Do you miss your family? A lot, yeah, every day. So how long have you been playing hockey? 
uh, since I was five, six. Is, is the sport really popular in your community? Yeah. Best thing to do in winter. What is it about hockey that you love so much? Skating, pe- the people I play with, also uh, the games. And so what do you think about the, the hockey school? It's good. More, more ice time for me since I can only skate in winter in my community. Oh, you guys don't have an arena? No, just the outdoor rink. Is the ice any different than the outdoor ice? Way different. We don't have a good Zamboni and stuff, so it's very rough and a bunch of cracks. And so when you came on this ice, did you just fly around the arena? Yeah. I had to get used to it for a while, yeah. What you're learning in this class, how is it helping you with your other studies? It makes me focus more, I guess, it's skating around because it helps me focus. So you said you were worried that you weren't going to fit in. Do you feel you fit in here? Yeah, yeah. Hockey and uh, sports and stuff, yeah. So, you know what, the talent is great, you know, they, they work extremely hard, but, you know, the ultimate goal is to have fun while we're learning. So I, I think so far the students have embraced it and they've really, um, they've, it's been a lot of fun. It's an honour to teach them. That was Mike Compon, former professional hockey player, who is now a teacher at DFC High School, where he teaches the school's brand new hockey class. This is Unreserved on CBC Radio 1, Sirius XM 169, and Native Voice 1. I'm Rosanna Deerchild. Window de Bois Musay Win is a patrol group in Thunder Bay, helping keep the streets of the city safe. A couple times a week, the group hops into trucks and patrols certain areas of the city. They offer hot chocolate, a hot meal, and blankets to those in need. And they keep an eye out for youth who might need help, or even something as simple as a ride home. Kristen Redsky is one of the organizers. She explains why the group was started. We are Window de Bois Mosewin. It means walking in truth. Uh, we are formerly known as the Bear Clan. We are currently patrolling um, the streets of Thunder Bay to make sure everyone's safe and warm for tonight and fed. It's just to, you know, uh, make people feel safe and just to be little eyes, be friends with people. Like, we're needed here, like, just to make sure people are okay out, out in the street and stuff. Just sometimes just people like sleeping and just asked if, you know, if they need water, if they need blankets, if they need food, if they need a ride somewhere. One of the areas the group visits is Kamenistaquea River Heritage Park, a location where they often find homeless people living. Kay Leatherdale explains why this area is important to check. We just took a walk around. Uh, it's like a model train. Sometimes people kind of camp underneath it. And so last week we found like a big pile of needles back there and a couple of people we gave food to. So we just went back to see if they're still there. And if we find like blankets and stuff, we might restock it with some things. There's like some like known spots people return to and we just check them out weekly. As well as patrolling, the group visits Shelter House, a shelter for people who are living in poverty. There, the group hands out food and water. Shelter House, we sometimes go there and, you know, just hand out food like hot dogs or sometimes you go all out and do bannock burgers or it's just kind of like a way to like connect with the community and see if they need anything else, you know, just to kind of like build friendships with other people and feel good helping someone that kind of needs help like with whatever they may need in that moment. If it puts a smile on her face, it makes me happy. So, elders first. <laughs> that was Kristen Redsky from Window de Bois Musewin Patrol in Thunder Bay. Twice a week, the group patrols the streets of Thunder Bay and hands out necessities like food, water, blankets, and love for those in need. That's it for this week's episode of Unreserved. We'll be back in this radio space next week for more community, culture, and conversation. This episode was produced by Stephanie Cram, Kyle Muzika, Zoe Tennant, and Anna Lazowski. I'm your favorite cousin, Rosanna Deerchild. Thank you for listening to Unreserved on CBC Radio 1. Ego say. For more CBC Podcasts, go to cbc.ca slash podcasts.